I think it's fair to say we are living through a time that none of us have ever experienced in our lives before. I mean, we didn't live through war time. So the only understanding most of us have of what that time was like in history is through our grandparents. My grandma doll lived through World War II. She lost two of her siblings to starvation. I remember her telling me these stories when I was a kid about how the Nazi soldiers invaded her home and how she hid under her bed and how they raided her house and took all the food that they had. I used to try and imagine what living through those circumstances was like, but honestly, I just couldn't wrap my head around that kind of reality or even living through that type of situation. Those stories that my grandma doll told me still resonate with me today. And the reason I bring this up is because we are living through our own version of wartime. Now, admittedly, this COVID crisis is extremely different. We're not being sent to war. There's actually a funny quote I'm sure many of you listening have seen on social media that says, quote, our grandparents were called to war. You're being called to sit on the couch. You can do this, end quote. So a little bit of perspective there. But the reality is people are dying. And the impact on business is astronomical. And I don't use that word lightly. Countless people have already lost their jobs. Businesses are closing. And we are only a few weeks into this crisis. So how bad is it going to get? How do we recover? Is there a silver lining? We need perspective on this. And my guest today can certainly provide that. She is the president and CEO of the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce. She has deep roots in our community and considerable experience in managing complex, multi-stakeholder projects. She has also worked in senior roles in the private, public, and not-for-profit sectors. She also devotes a considerable amount of volunteer time to the boards of countless organizations. She's the board chair of the Edmonton Oilers Community Foundation, a director on the board of NATE and the Association of Chamber of Commerce Executives. She is campaign chair for United Way of the Alberta Capital Region, board chair of both McEwen University and the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce, and she sits on advisory committees for Edmonton airports and the Edmonton Community Foundation. Friends, that is just to name a few. The list is very long and add to that the recognition that comes with her work, including being honored with the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal and twice being named one of Alberta's 50 most influential people. She's also mom to two grand or two children and four grandchildren. Friends, I have the utmost respect for this woman. I'm honored to call her a friend. She's a powerhouse in the business community. I'm so, so thrilled that the one and only Janet Riappel is stepping into the inner circle today. It is so wonderful to see you, Janet. Thank you so much for this conversation. Wow. Well, Carrie, I'm honored to be here. Uh, you know, uh, you forgot to say um, how much I admire you and what a great friend you've been to me. And uh, <laughs> so I really appreciate being here. Probably the most important thing right now that you said was about my family, um, because mm -hmm. that's my support network right now. And you were talking about troubling times. Uh, I, feel, I feel just absolutely blessed to have such a strong support network right now, friends mm -hmm. and coworkers and family around me. Isn't that what's most important right now? And please tell me that your family's healthy, everyone as well. They are, thank you. Even my mother, 86 years old, is uh, just uh, full of spunk and learning FaceTime. And she's got all her <laughs> technology up and we're all trying to learn so we can continue to communicate. Isn't that the truth? The learning curve is so steep right now with technology yeah. because, and we need it because that's how we have to communicate. So uh, let me begin by asking you this question. Uh, I want you to put on your, your business hat, but or not with how you answer this, your immediate response to the COVID crisis. What are your thoughts, Janet? Well, I, I, you know, I've been asked to describe how I feel in one word on a couple of meetings now, and uh, I'm overwhelmed. 
Um, I think this is a time that uh, none of us know how to deal with. None of us really understand where to go next or what to do next. Um, I've got a team. I actually have a small team. I only have, you know, 25 people to, to connect with. It's, it's still very, very tough to be able to, to, when you're used to being a people to people person, I'm used to having contact and sitting and talking to people in all aspects of my life. Now everything's being done by screens, you know, with little earpieces in and trying to figure out how to communicate. Now take that into a, 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 a business context. And so, you know, 85% of our community are small and mid-sized enterprises. So that's less than 50 people and most often less than 10. They are, they've been bouncing along the bottom of an economic downturn that's now in its sixth year. Our sixth year, we entered 2020. We actually were talking, I, I felt buoyed by people that were saying, it's gonna get better now. And, and attitudes were lifting because we've had some pretty, pretty dismal outlooks mm -hmm. um, that, that, have, that have pervaded just everything we've done for the last few years. And now we were all excited that, you know, things are gonna get better. And then, and, and, then, and then two superpowers decided to start uh, warring with each other over the price of oil. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a stock market that crashes, and we've got a pandemic unlike anything that most of us have ever seen. And I know you were talking about the Second World War. Yes. My father-in-law mm -hmm. father would talk about the Spanish flu which he didn't call yeah. that, in fact. He just talked about how he lived in outside of Morinville and he watched his brothers strapped to a bed die and they couldn't visit with their neighbors and all they could do was try to signal or get notes to each other about what was happening in every household because the only thing they knew was you can't go outside. You have to stay wow. in, you have to contain this as best you can. So it was here. We call mm -hmm. it, you know, it's called the Spanish flu, but it was here and it was very real then. And it seems like this pandemic is is very similar to that now. But well, we it's have funny how that resonates, right? Yeah. It's funny how yeah. that now that story, you know, I'm sure that when he used to tell you that, this seemed like a world, a lifetime, never going to happen. And all of a sudden, we're living our own reality of that, yeah, which is, you know, which is crazy. You know, I need to ask you this, um, and I don't want to dwell on the negative, but from a business perspective, and, and you kind of painted a bit of a picture, but just like how bad is this right now? Uh, well, it, it's, it's very bad. I mean, these are our job creators, right? These are the economic engine that drive, that drive our economy, um, these business owners and they're trying really hard to maintain like some sense of um, stability or or control and and calm in a, in a very chaotic atmosphere right in a, in a in a totally uncontrollable and rapidly changing environment this is not something that any of us were equipped to for nobody plans for that nobody thinks this is going to happen I, uh, we've been doing some survey work. We've done a lot of things to talk mm -hmm. to the business community. So we've gone out to the broad business community, not just, not just chamber members. We've gone out to the broad business community and we've asked them, you know, what's going on in your world? What's happening? We, we launch, we'll launch into our third week of a survey this week, but we've had two weeks of survey work. I'll, I'll just speak. I've got some numbers here. I oh, yeah, think I they're shocking. I was going to ask. I want to yeah, hear them. We do, you know, yeah. we just got them, the, 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 the boiled down. I've got the, the um, early findings, I guess you'd call them. So 99% of respondents have lost revenue compared to last week, 88%. So it's gone up oh, to gosh. 100%. 100% mm -hmm. are losing revenue. 88% have, have reduced staff or, 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 or expecting very shortly to be reducing their staff loads. This is 75% are encouraging their staff to work from home. This is how fast this is changing. Last week, that was 42%. Oh my God. So it's gone it's from doubled. 42 to 75% that are saying yes, where we're expecting our staff to work from home. 25%, this is, I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve here. I'm sorry, but 25% don't have enough cash on hand to make payroll. Oh gosh. So 
and 47% say that there's a possibility they're going to just go out of business entirely. It's 47%. So what's happening? I mean, we are, we're desperate and, and it's so important right now that somehow we get money into the hands of employers and employees so that they can at least hang on a little longer because we don't even know how long this is going to go on. I know. I know. And when you say you wear your heart on your sleeve, I don't blame you. I mean, you're, as you're reading those numbers, it brought tears to my eyes. I can't help I it. I just, so many people are suffering right now. Is there, are there any businesses that are immune to this? Is any? You know, yeah, there are businesses that are, you know, businesses that are, are doing better just because of the situation and the circumstances. So there's some manufacturing businesses. I mean, personal protective equipment right now is, as, as we've all heard, almost impossible to find. So those that are producing that kind of equipment are, are doing fine. Um, there's, there, there, there are other like service providers that are doing fine if they were providing in a different way, not face to face, mm -hmm. you know, but right now th those are few and far between. It's a very, very small percentage. Large companies are hurting bad, but they'll be, they'll be okay. They will figure out, they've got the resources to figure out how to, to build some sustainability into their, if they haven't, you know, because of other situations. I mean, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of our large energy sector companies, I mean, talk about having to build sustainability into your organization. Yeah. They've already had to do that in spades, as I say, mm -hmm. sixth year of this downturn. So, but the small businesses, those smaller businesses, they're, they're just barely hanging on by a thread. And they're big employers. So I know that you have a pulse, your pulse on, on businesses everywhere. What are they saying to you? Have you talked to some of them? What are you hearing? Well, they're just asking for help. Um, you know, businesses are saying that, you know, things like moving the deadlines for income tax payments and that into August is, is really helping. Those emergency payments for people that have to self-isolate and don't have EI benefits, that's really helping. A lot, a lot of the times when you talk to business owners, what they're talking about is how it's helping the individuals that they employ that they might not be able to keep employed right now. Mm -hmm. Because that's what's the most important thing to a business owner is making sure that those people that are like, you spend a lot of time with the people that you work with. Yeah. Those people are your family. And you want to make sure that they're whole, that they can, they can somehow afford to, to be calm and mm -hmm. be, be careful and, and, be um, feel some sense of control and some sense of community in a time like this. That's really important to employers. So they really want that. Um, you know, right now, little things are really helping. Like with, with the government saying, yes, we're closing out all non-essential non services, mm -hmm. which honestly has to happen, right? How yeah. can anyone refute that, including the, the providers of those services? But the government saying we will allow like curbside delivery, pickup options, things like that. That allows an employer to keep some people employed. It allows some, some, some services or products to get into the marketplace. I live next door to High Street. I walked around yesterday. I see Patty's Cheese says just phone us. I see Carol's Sweep says just phone us. We'll, we'll arrange, we'll mm -hmm. you know, package something up for you. That's going to help those small businesses. And we have many, many, many in our community. So what other things can businesses be doing right now? What advice would you give them to try and survive during this time? And how do they pivot and innovate? What, what, what's yeah. your advice there? Well, you know, I think, I, I think uh, first of all, uh, we're trying to provide as many resources as we can online. So the Chamber website right now, we have a COVID preparedness section that's broken off into different areas. So into labor uh, laws, legislation, standards. It's broken into, um, you know, government actions in, in, in relation to taxation or in relation to any number of different areas. It's also uh, offering up advice from key 
senior consulting firms that are saying, here are things, uh, business that you can look at for your own specific business. So we're doing that. We also have a matching thing online because one of the things that's happening, I, I mentioned PPEs, but so if you're looking for face masks and sanitizer and that you run a small, a small, you know, facility. In fact, you know, one of the, one of the um, uh, companies that reached out to us run a, run um, seniors homes, but small ones. And yes. they're, they're desperate for this stuff. So we put up a support network and that support network allows um, you to match. So if you've got something that you can lend to the cause, there are companies that need it. You can be matched. And we, I, you know, I just talked to um, um, Boyle Macaulay Health Center on Friday. They have the same problems. Um, you know, as businesses are hurting, families are hurting, but boy, our community is hurting bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right now our community, you know, uh, the, the, all of the, the services, Bissell Center and Boyle and everything, they need clothing for people. Mm -hmm. And they can't just take clothing. So they need money. That's the same with the food bank. They can't just take food anymore. So they need money. So we need to try to find a way to match all those resources and, and help our community be, remain stable and strong. I love that you're offering these opportunities because I think one of the biggest responsibilities too as a business owner is finding out what packages to um, financial aid is available out there because you said there's tons. Yeah, there's tons. It, and, and it's confusing and it's it very is. noisy. So for a small business owner, we want to make it easy for them. They don't have HR teams. They don't have, you know, legal counsel and advisors like that. We want to make it easy for them. We want to parcel it in, play, in, in buckets that they can look at and easily get some sense of who, the, who else to call or what they can access. So we're, we're you, trying really hard. How do you see this impacting stay-at-home businesses? Well, uh, you know, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It depends what the stay-at-home business was offering, I guess. Um, if you're if you're offering a service that's still in need, if you're offering a some kind of consulting services, right? Um, I've seen lots of counseling services, um, HR services. Those people have been working from home. They're set up. They know how, mm -hmm. and they're they're there and they're they're ready, willing, and able to help. Um, I see the the problem being for that is that the firms that need their help may not have any any funding to be able mm -hmm. to pay for those. That's services. the challenge. That's the challenge. Yeah. And you know that a lot of the things that businesses are doing right now, like they're pitching in to do things, they're doing them at great personal cost, right? They're doing them, they're doing them because they know it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, business people, I see it all over. They're sharing best practices. They're saying, "Hey, I can help you with that." They're reaching out, but as they're observing all of the, all of the, the restrictions, the daily announcements of what what else cannot continue anymore. This is a great uh, personal cost for, for business people. It is. It, the, let, let's flip this uh, on its head, if we can, for a second. Uh, perspective. Let's say someone has lost their job at a large company and they want to follow a passion that's been in their heart and mind for years. Uh, is this the time to turn that vision into a reality? Are there opportunities here that we can capitalize on some sort of a silver lining? Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And uh, even I said, when I, when I had to meet with my team and send them home, I said, now's your chance. Like, now's your chance to do some planning about what you really want to, you know, what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. Or take an online language course. Or take, go, go to the library. If you go onto the library site, there are tons of free courses online that you can take to improve your financial knowledge, mm -hmm. your language skills, your, your any kind of skill, you can find it online. And so I said, take advantage of that because we typically, all of us, we run our people hard. We run ourselves hard. We run our people hard. Yes. If there's some time now to sit back and think, consider it that luxury. You don't have to sit and play video games or watch, <laughs> you know, watch streaming services um you don't yeah i mean sure i love doing that too but you but you don't have to just do that you can actually think ahead and maybe maybe i think it's going to happen with my team 
I think I'm, I have a bunch of smart people. I think they're going to come back with all kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. No idea how I will handle that when we all come back together, but how exciting that I'll have people that hopefully will be more energized about new ways of operating and new things that we should be doing. So I love that perspective, Janet, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs also can, if you can survive it, first of all, just look at ways to pivot. How can yeah. we pivot and do things differently in uh, our company? In some ways, it will wipe the slate clean of mistakes you've made and allow you to think differently about uh, you know, doing something and structuring your company. So there are ways that you could reinvent yourself through this, are there not? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, looking at, as I say, personal improvement, looking at your business and saying, what haven't I done? And you know, it's going to cause us as employers to look at things too and say, well, maybe that, that, that um, I, I run a really traditional shop. I really do. Everybody comes in in the mornings, they work a full day and they go home. Um, you know, maybe that's not the way that we'll operate in future. I think there's going to be some good things that will come out of this. You know, one of them is that most, you, you've started with this, most of us have not lived through even a downturn. I likened our economy to the 80s. And I used to say, you know, in the 80s, because I personally lost my house, I lost my car, Did I had two you? little kids. Yeah, I lost my job, my husband lost his job. And we had, you know, we had two little kids and we had to figure out, okay, now what do we do? that hasn't happened in a very long time, a sustained economic downturn that you just can't hang on anymore. And that's what the 80s was. But now I think it's going to be, um, I think everybody should consider this a, a real time for personal growth and to, to really look at how they're operating and how they want to operate in future. And that's what the 80s did to me. And I always look back at them as some of the hardest of times some of the absolute best of times that really framed me like who I am now. They really framed me. They wove right into my fabric and, and changed the way I looked at things. I love that. That was my next question is what you learned from it, but I appreciate that you, that positive perspective in it. I, I need to ask this before I, I leave this because how bad do you think it's going to get? Like, I know you have a, a, a crystal ball on your desk that you keep calling. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but well, honestly, one of those black or, um, yes, balls. Those, <laughs> I know. I totally know. My kids used to have one too, and you'd shake it and you'd wait for the crazy answer to come. Uh, like, yeah. what's your perspective? You lived through the 80s, you've lived through economic yeah. downturns. Of yeah. course, we had, you know, our so called uh, Great Recession from 2008 to 10. How bad is this going to get before we come out the other side? I think we're in for uh, uh, I think we're in for a lot more pain, and I do because it's not because everything that I'm hearing, um, you know, from our chief medical officers and everybody is, it's it's nowhere near hitting its pinnacle, and it's the it's the length of time that this is going to spread out that is going to create the most pain. So I I don't know how bad it's going to get. I don't know. I probably don't want to know, to be honest. Yeah. But, but, um, but I remain hopeful that, uh, that, that, that we will be able to weather this and come out the other side much better, much stronger, much more focused on what's really important. At times like these, you really start to weed out what's important, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, personally Absolutely. and professionally, you just and start to weed it out. And I guess that's what we all need to be doing right now to survive. Yeah. 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 It's um, to survive and hopefully to thrive in different ways. Right. I, uh, you know, I, I, so I employ a lot of 20 to 30 somethings and, mm -hmm. and, and I have children and I just say, look at these times as, as, uh, as times that you have to be very conscious of how you conduct yourself how you act with other people, what you do to try to, to, to continue to give back and build your community because they will stay with you when you're my age, when you're my mother's age, you're going to look back and you're going to remember exactly where you were when COVID-19 hit mm -hmm. and you're going to remember how you acted. And, you know, we always say act with integrity. Well, this is just really going to challenge that. How are you going to feel when you look in the mirror? It doesn't matter. Just 
think about that all the time. Think about your own personal conduct and what your contribution is, Mm -hmm. because that's really going to matter to you. It it will matter to everybody, uh, you know, in years to come, how they acted now. So important. It's like the story you told us about your grandfather living through the Spanish flu and and what Mm. he remembers and how that still resonates today in my own story. So Speaking of stories, let's shift gears because the inner circle is, of course, all about stories and journeys. And I started by digging into the reality of business in light of COVID-19. But I've always, uh, like I said, admired you from afar. I've introduced you many times at events over the years uh, uh, where I was emceeing and always wondered, you know, wanted to know more about your success because I have all the respect Mm -hmm. in the world for you. Give us a glimpse of your story. Janet, how the heck did you get into business and climb the ladder so quickly? Well, you know, I started my story uh, young and and fast. Uh, I, I have, I didn't realize it till I was older, but if something scares me, I run right at it. And I think that's, that's really worked for me. I, instead of stepping back and trying to analyze it, I run straight at it. Where does that come from? I don't, I don't know where that comes from, but you know, I mean, I was the oldest in five kids. We were all a year apart. We were raised in, you know, challenging times for my parents. And I, I think I always had some challenges in my life and, and so I would just, I'd run right at them. And I, uh, I, I developed a sense of infallibility that, I, that I, I could do it and I'd be okay. Like I'd be okay. I don't know how, but I'd be okay. I could jump in that hole and somehow I could reach out and someone would pull me up. At times there hasn't been a hand there and I've been mm-hmm. like, hey, somebody. But, <laughs> um, but I always believed I'd be okay. And, uh, and that, that, I think that stood me in, in very good stead. You know, I, I, uh, I married at 19. I had my wow. kids in my early twenties. As I, as I was having, my children are a year apart. As I was having them, I said, Oh brother, now I need better education. So I worked full time, had the two kids, had a husband working in the patch up North and I was going to university. Um, so, I, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't recommend that life to anybody, <laughs> but it worked for me and I learned a lot. And, uh, I, um, uh, I, I actually really value that time as a, as a growth time. I'm so glad I did it then because good mm-hmm. Lord, who has that energy once you, uh, once you go through, but I was, right. young. um, I, I had people that believed in me and I think that was so important to me. I, um, I had people that would say, well, you know what that means? You're going to have to do this. Mm-hmm. And I'd say, well, I can't, I can't do that. And I would just, I learned to just look in their eyes and let them mirror what I could do so that I could, they were my mirror and they would show me that, that, that I could do it. And then I just took it on. And, you know, I'm, I've never been the brightest, smartest, any, but boy, I'm a hard worker and I will put my back into something and my passion into it. And I will outwork anybody. And I still do that today. And I, I'll outwork you. I can guarantee it because <laughs> that's just how I look at things. And I just, I go hard at it. I don't doubt that I for know. one second. I, I need to ask you this question because it's an important one. It comes with all due respect. And because you and I recently sat on a, a radio show together discussing this about on International Women's Day, through this whole journey as you were, you know, working hard and digging in and raising children and going to university, did you ever see yourself as a woman? And I think you probably know what I mean by that. Well, um, I've always been conscious of my gender, for sure. But I I didn't approach things that I was a female and this is what, I mean, I guess other than having children, which nobody else gets to do, but women. Let me hop in and give you more perspective on that question. What I mean by that is, did you ever see yourself as a woman? I I should, I remember the first time I got my first job in broadcasting and Mm. uh, my boss said to me, well, your male cohort only makes this. And why would you um, be, be thinking that you deserve more than that, almost like mm-hmm. less? And I remember saying to him, I'm a human being and I deserve mm-hmm. to be paid what I'm worth. 
And I remember saying that I had at the time, I used my post-secondary education. You got, I said, you, you have to tell me that six years of post-secondary education is worth something. And if you want to debate this issue, he only has two. So where do we stand on here? I, I always like to challenge back. And it was the right. first time someone made me aware because I always just saw myself as a human being that was like, well, you're a woman and maybe you don't deserve as much as that man. And I'm like, what? It was confusing to me. And it, it, the first time someone kind of s shined a spotlight on it, but I never let that stand in my way or I thought any differently because you're a woman, you can't break through that ceiling or you can't achieve top pay. I just put my head down like you and I work my ass off essentially is what I did over the years. And I was never afraid of working long days or hard days. So that's the context and the spirit. I come to you yeah. with that question and I'm looking for your perspective on it as you climb the ladder and I'm going to dig into your board work. You sit on a lot of powerful boards and organizations. Yeah. That, you know, years ago, there were, it was usually solid suits around the table. And I know because I've been there. So give me your perspective on that, Janet. Well, I mean, so I've always been in male-dominated industries. And I, I don't think I ever really saw myself um, as anything but one of them. Um, but, I, I mean, every once in a while, you'd encounter something that you go, oh, what is that? But for the most part, I just uh, would do, I'd just be my best. And I would push ahead in, in that regard in, to be my best. Um, I had those kinds of conversations too, Carrie, where, where uh, you know, they would say, well, he's got two kids at home and a wife that doesn't work and your husband works. And so why would you, why would you be entitled to that? Because I am, because, because I've demonstrated, you know, often, often I, uh, I will say that this, I think, is more of a female thing. Women have to often do the job for a while before they're recognized for doing the job. Now, I try, I try to bring that to every individual that I work with, but it was, all, it was at that time always women that had to. At that time, when you walked into a boardroom, if you were too conscious of being a female, that got in the way of a lot of stuff because you did sit at board tables with just men. Um, and, you know... I sat at many tables where if I had a male that was with me, mm -hmm. they would be talking to him and he worked for me. And when it was time to make a decision, I, and I honestly, I found some humor in it I, I, because I, there's nothing to be gained by just getting mad about at everything, right? And being angry about things. I, I sat back and found some humor in their ignorance or their, you know, their inability to, to work with me. And so, you know, I had, I had a classic one that the young man that, uh, well, he's not so young anymore, that worked for me then, he finally just said, when they said, so what do you think? He said, well, I, like, this is, this is the woman that's going to make the decision, to what, this woman right here, and pointed, and all these heads in the room just turned, just turned to look at me as if, I don't know, I, you know, they couldn't believe that I got to make decisions. Um, I, um, I think that we have to uh, conduct ourselves as women the very same way that we expect men to conduct themselves. And I think that we have to set an expectation that we will be treated the very same way that they are. And I think that um, you'll always sort of encounter people that push back a little bit. But for the most part, I'm not, sometimes I'm not even sure that it's because of my gender. Sometimes I think it's probably other things that, that can be interpreted as a gender thing, but it's not really. It's, okay. it's just the way people look at things. So in that, I don't know if that then, answered that No, it, it is. All. It's great perspective, and it's important to be discussing these things. So I, I want to know, on, in that spirit, when you were climbing the corporate ladder, what things did you do personally to take your skill set and set you apart from others and help open doors for you? Is there any advice that you can give women who are, you know, looking to shatter that glass ceiling? Yeah, well, I'll tell you personally, um, you know, I got involved in my community and I got involved in my community in a lot of ways. You referenced like me being on boards and all kinds yes. of stuff. Well, yes. you know, 
the the first things I did were like volunteering to go out and, and um, you know work on my parent teacher association and be the treasurer, or you know I like just just helping um, smaller organizations. Then when I had enough time, I joined I actually joined the Chamber of Commerce and a Rotary Club, and I did that because I wanted um, service and I wanted business and I wanted somehow to get in and. When I joined them, I've always believed this, even with my kids when they got into post-secondary and into high school, I said, join clubs. Like get involved in clubs because it makes everything more meaningful for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I continued to do that. Well, I so the chamber was great. I joined a committee. I worked on a committee. I worked hard. The, the Rotary Club was awesome because I could actually talk about my kids. And I and it was actually the first female Rotary Club in Edmonton, <laughs> but I could talk. We formed it, and I could talk about being a female in business and have a group that sat around and understood what I was talking about. But I think that getting involved, I think figuring out where your place is to to make some contribution, it all comes back in spades. And if you're really passionate about it, if you really believe in what you're involved in, it it serves you as much as it's serving your community wherever you are you'll meet a whole new group of people they'll give you all new insights you might completely change your focus you know i was in land development i totally changed my focus i went out on my own and i did everything but land development because i was getting that feedback from my community about all the opportunities that were out there that i knew nothing about so i so i really recommend that and yes sure as you go through that you you volunteer more and more and you see areas of need and mm -hmm. you say, yeah, I can help. Or they come to you. You know, I get lots that come to me and say, we need help. Can you help us? And I, I, I want to do it. I want to give back as much as I mm -hmm. can. I, without sacrificing my Such family is paramount. Advice. My family's paramount. Yes. So without sacrificing that or, or my body of work, I want to do whatever I can. And the community needs us. I mean, now more than ever, but our community always needs us. What do you see as perhaps some of the biggest mistakes that women make when they're looking for leadership roles or looking to climb the ladder? Are there things that you have observed mm. that we're doing that you would say, you know what, I would go this direction instead? Are we putting limits on ourselves in certain ways? Have you noticed anything over your years? Um, uh, you know, sometimes the biggest thing I observe is that we, we have a, a chip on our shoulder or we carry some burden on our shoulders that causes us to just project in a way that is, um, you know, less than productive and, and less than uh, engaging. And, uh, and I think we have to be careful of that. Um, I actually observe that in young men now too, I do, um, and maybe because I have more than ever in my midst, but I think it's really important that we um, recognize that, um, you know, I, I think we have to go into things uh, with open minds, knowledge, understanding, but I think we have to be very careful not to carry some attitude in us that is almost, it's almost repels. Um, or it sounds entitled uh, because we're not we're not entitled to things. It's not a sense of entitlement. I think is is not productive at all. Do you know what I mean? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. Expecting something until you really prove yourself and just put your head down and do the work. Yeah, you you have to earn. You know, that's always been the where I've done best is when I've when I've worked hard to earn mm -hmm. that that respect or that. Um, new role, uh, that, uh, that, that um, uh, understanding of me, I have to work really hard to earn those things. They, they don't come easy. Now, lots has not come easy to me. But, but I, when, you, when you actually do work hard to earn something, boy, it's, it's ever mm -hmm. so much more rewarding for you, I think. You have such a rich career. And Janet, can you just give us a snapshot of, of what that career looked like and areas in business you worked and maybe as well some of the most important lessons that uh, you learned along the way? Oh, that's a, a, big, a big question. Um, 
so I, you know, I, I, uh, I started in the land development industry and I worked there until uh, I felt that I'd, I'd given it everything that I could and then I needed a bigger, broader view. As I said, I joined, you know, different organizations to volunteer, but I went out mm -hmm. on my own. I started taking work in the land development industry. You, you work with government, but on a on very opposite sides of the fence. So I started taking work with the public sector so that I could understand uh, better. And it, it gave me a very broad appreciation. I mean it an appreciation for how hard the public sector works and how it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so then I, I did a lot of work that was um, um, facilitation work in a, in a broad sense. I ended up being sort of a troubleshooter. So if, if a client had a problem that they didn't know what they were going to do with it called Janet because Janet will run <laughs> at it. Janet will jump in the hole and she will start to try to develop some plans and some sense of structure and organization and some form of consultation, be that with community or other stakeholders to try to make things work. I became sort of that person that would just go out. I did some amazing project work. I, uh, work that I'm very proud of, um, volunteer coordination work to, to consolidate our, our airport efforts here in Edmonton, um, work up in Three Sisters with all orders of government and with the, with the private sector to get some master planning done in, in, up in there that would protect our environment and our transportation corridors, but also allow those communities to grow in, an, in, a, un, in, in a, a uniform um, mm -hmm. way. I, uh, I, I even did a, a television uh, show, little segment that would talk about the good news in Edmonton, yeah, through CFRN, where I would go and we'd film different areas and show people what businesses were doing and what they, how they were growing and what they were contributing. It was, that was a ton of fun. Um, um, at the same time then, as you know, as you've referenced, I, I got involved in all kinds of areas. So. In my volunteer life, and you know, when when um, uh, Premier Klein uh, came in, he had to take on um, some some very tough measures, not unlike our government now, and actually most governments for many years now. But when he first came in, it was very evident to me that health and education, same things, were going to be um, mm -hmm. in, in tremendous challenge, right? They're the biggest, biggest portions of the budget. And how do you handle the costs associated and make sure that you're getting delivery that is going to make the return that you desperately need it to make? So I volunteered. I volunteered to be on the McEwen board. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I felt with McEwen, I was that student. I was that mature learner with kids that, that was the student at the time that mm -hmm. had to uh, get their education at the same time they had to work. And how do you make your education relevant so that you get meaningful work? So I volunteered, I became the chair of that board uh, eventually after about a year. Uh -huh. um, but I, uh, the United Way at the time, the community was hurting hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, the economy was limping. I'll tell you this boom and bust economy of ours, eh? But uh, yes. on United Way, uh, I was asked, would you be the campaign chair? Because yeah, it was tough. It was tough for them to try to keep business engaged. I, I said, yes, terrified me. Um, we did very, very well that year. Thank you. Thank you, community. Thank you, everybody. But we, um, I, I, I continued to do stuff like that. Uh, Compassion House, you know, which takes in women that need, uh, need care and they need a safe place to stay while they seek their, um, their uh, treatments at the cross. Mm -hmm. I came in there, actually, they brought me on because they wanted me to bring governance, a govern and I'm pretty good at governance on boards, um, to bring governance into their structure. They had a management board and they were doing great work. They had to grow, the need was huge. Uh, so I came in and did that and I made it. I said to them, okay, two things I won't do on this one. I cannot move into your executive, an executive role and I cannot, um, do fundraising for you because I'm doing I've done way too much in the community I've made way too many asks well you know two years later I was the board <laughs> chair <laughs> and we were embarking on a new build and we needed uh, we mm -hmm. needed to raise funds but boy was that worthwhile and you know Compassion House is doing extraordinarily well still and making such contributions into the community so again um 
I, I continued to grow. I did go back to land development after uh, about 15 years or so. I went back and started taking on project work. Then I went and worked for Mayor Mandel and I helped him with some key areas that they needed help with. And, uh, and one day, I said, you know, I chaired the board of the Chamber of Commerce um, in 1996. Mm -hmm. So one day I'm walking through past the patio and uh, saw a friend who sat on, was on the Commerce uh, Chamber's board. She said, you know, you should come back in and just take that chamber where it needs to go, wherever that is. So I researched, I looked, chamber needed modernization. It needed to come into the new world of business. It needed to to really up its game in a different dynamic way, using technology to full advantage. I went and met with the board. They said, you, you know, you know the chamber world. I've been a member forever. And uh, you know the chamber world. You know what you need as a member. We will support you 100%. And here I am. And you know, I think this uh, is, I'm 64. I'm going to be 65. I hope I'm not celebrating my 65th oh my birthday gosh. here in this office. But if I am, the next mm -hmm. time you see me, I'll have a bottle of great bubbly and a beautiful glass in my hand. Um, but I'm, <laughs> here I am now thinking, if this is my last career stop, and this could be, I've had a fantastic mm -hmm. career. And if this is my last one, I'll tell you, I really feel like I've made a difference in this role. I really do. Oh, I love hearing that. And I like, I, as I mentioned, it's so rich, a rich journey. And I love the volunteerism um, thread that connects everything. I, I often say as well, that that's where you can gain such valuable experience. And you can make mistakes, but that's how you learn. It's like, how do I get that skill set? Well, go volunteer. And then suddenly yeah. you're the board chair, or you're leading this. <laughs> and, and it's the, it really is the key key to finding so many important positions along the way as you have well proved through it all janet the number one thing you have learned through all these years of business and experience what can you share with our listeners today to maybe uplift them empower them through their journey right now oh um you know, the, the, the first thing is, and I, I did reference this earlier, but um, your integrity is really one of the only things that you own yourself. Nobody, nobody owns your integrity, mm -hmm. but they can take it away. They can, you can compromise it because of whatever situation you're faced with. Protect your integrity above all else. Look at things that way. Ask yourself, challenge yourself. How will that make me feel? How will that impact how I'm, what I'm giving back to the community and protect that, hold it dear to yourself, your integrity. Make sure that you're not compromising that, that you're acting as, as clearly and fairly and, and completely as you can. Um, the other thing is, maybe more important now than ever, don't harbor anger and grief at things. A address them. Talk to somebody. Address it with somebody. But don't harbor that in you. I don't think it's good for you. I personally don't believe that being angry or frustrated or mad is healthy for you in any way. So mm -hmm. figure out how to deal with it. Figure out what you have to do and then let go of it. Let go of it so that you can move forward because it is a huge wall, a huge barrier. And then you know what? And I have to remind myself of this all the time because I have a very, I used to have anyway, a very short fuse. So my temper was always sort of sitting in the background in that, right? Let, let go of some of that and realize that you just don't know what people are dealing with. I guess now more important than ever. Mm -hmm. but, but be compassionate and be kind to people. And Try to remind yourself just to not overreact to people and, and just smile at people and try to try to give them some joy in their day because it comes back to you threefold. You know, when, I, when I've been unkind to people, I feel horrible about it. And later it just bothers me. I can't sort mm -hmm. of let it go. Well, so don't do it in the first place. I don't know, yes. Carrie, like, yes. Thank you, you know. Thank My you. mother is so kind and people love her and it's because she just lets them know she matters. 
I've had good role models in this regard. Yes, you certainly have. And you're definitely one for me. So like I said, I've watched from a distance and learned from you and and just loved having this conversation with you. Janet, for people that want more information, where can perhaps they find you or the chamber? What are the resources? Where do we go online? Well, you know, uh, edmontonchamber.com, if you're looking for business resources, if you want me personally, uh, I'm, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. I'm easy. I don't actually, mm-hmm. I don't use Instagram and I have a Twitter account, but I don't check it a lot. Um, but you can reach out. My information is online as well at the chamber okay. site and my cell phone and my, my email. I am happy to help if I can. Um, if I can't, I have this broad, long, deep network now that is more than willing to step up to help. So I can probably make an introduction, make a connection that will help. And I'm happy to do that. And you know, my friends and my network, they're so great. They, mm-hmm. they don't hold anything back. So I think we can do it. We, were, we do it together, right? Janet, uh, wealth of information as always, and uh, the inspiration Jerry, and empowerment. Just- there you are. You froze. Sorry. I, I know. It's the minute. reality, our new reality of doing yes. everything through these Zoom calls and recording podcasts and having our <laughs> meetings and where you just navigate the glitches and everything. <laughs> uh, listen, I just want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to you for taking the time to have this important conversation today. It's rich with uh, learning and so much great advice for businesses that are trying their best to navigate the these turbulent times. And I love leaving this on the note of that you said more than ever, we need to be kind to one another and hold space for one another because we're living in extraordinary times right now. And when we can, uh, gratitude reciprocates itself. And when we can extend that to one another, (laughs) it makes a difference. So that's so well said. Thank you. So let me ex- extend mine to you, Janet, today for taking the time out of your busy day to step into the inner circle. We appreciate your perspective today. Wow, oh, been a rare privilege. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you.